Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that intro to a flight or a <laughs> suspiciously expensive cinema. The, uh, my name's Torsten Bell. I'm the chief executive of the Resolution Foundation, and you're all uh, very welcome here today. We're here to launch the Resolution Foundation's macro policy unit. But before I start, talk a bit about that, I just want to say a few thanks, obviously, to the team that have organized this. I'm hoping in a post-Brexit world, we'll obviously be able to scrap all security rules, so you'll be able to get into buildings like this in seconds after we've left the EU. But I also want to say thank you to Stephanie Flanders for hosting us uh, today. It's very kind of you indeed. We're grateful. You should also all be grateful, because otherwise you would be in Westminster, two big downsides. There's at least a 50% chance for resignation at any event in Westminster at the moment. And all we would talk about in Brexit would be Brexit. And here you're gonna get about 50% not Brexit. So that is a uh, plus. Now, the order of play today is, in a second I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna give you a few words about why we're bothering to do this at all. The, um, uh, then James Smith, our research director, is gonna take you through the headlines of the report we've published today, which is an assessment of the UK's macroeconomic framework. Um, and then we're going to hear from our speakers and responders who don't really need introductions, and I'm definitely not going to do all their titles because we'll be here for some time. But first of all, you're going to hear from our host, Stephanie Flanders, who is the head of Bloomberg Economics, then from Dr. Jan Vlieger, who's been on the Monetary Policy Committee since 2015, and uh, a few things before that. Um, Dame Kate Barker, who I'm definitely not going to list everything she's done, but is also ex of the MPC and also on the government's Industrial Strategy Council at the moment. And then we'll hear from Rupert Harrison, who is the chief macro strategist at BlackRock and in the past did some things in British macro policy. Uh, then we're going to hear your um, Q&A, answers and questions welcome from the floor. Uh, but first of all, let's just kick off with a few words of intro. Just first of all, to touch on uh, why um, are we bothering doing any of this at all? So the Resolution Foundation is an economic research institute focused on issues around living standards, and particularly the living standards of those on lower middle incomes. That's our charitable purpose. That's why the taxpayer relieves the money we spend. We already do lots of work on labor markets, tax and benefit policy, housing, assets, all the rest. Why look at macro policy? Well, I'm going to offer two rather obvious things. And we were having a conversation with our trustees about 18 months ago saying, what are the areas that have had a big effect on living standards that we don't do a lot of work on? And a chart like this comes to mind, looking at incomes uh, over the last 10 years. And I think if you didn't pre-financial crisis think that macro policy had a big effect on people's living standards, you probably do since. I think it is worth reflecting. I often read things saying this, the pay squeeze we're currently living through or this charts like this, they're caused by changes to inequality or you know, lots of other things going on. There's bits of that going on, but really, this is all just caused by poor macro performance. Weak productivity is the reason pay growth has been so slow, particularly in the last few years when we've had a tight labor market and other things are important, but less important in that big picture. So that's the, uh, the first reason. The second thing is to say from a perspective of lower middle income families, in general, uh, recessions are worse for them. Now, not always in the immediate part of the crisis. So if you have a high unemployment recession, you definitely are worse for the bottom end. Uh, but if you have, as we had in the last crisis, a lower unemployment recession and a big squeeze on earnings, it's not as bottom heavy, but the long-term pain is still disproportionate for the bottom. And I'll just show you a reason why that is. So this is showing you consumption, percent of consumption spent on essentials by income quartile. So poorest families at the top, uh, richest families at the bottom, showing you the change in essential spending as a share of consumption um, since the financial crisis, showing you the peak of that in 2017, and then where it's got to now, in 2012, sorry. Um, now, the, the thing I want to draw your attention to here is, obviously, the biggest increase in um, essential spending is by the poor families. You'd have expected that. Any given squeeze on earnings, they have less capacity to cut back non-essential um, uh, spending. Now, but the key issue is really that the increase that happened from 2006, so around 52%, and then rising up towards um, 60%, has not faded. So if we go into another downturn in the future, we're going into it with a baseline, which is there. The, 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 um, the profit and loss of those households, their annual position has already done a lot of what the coping mechanism it can do, which is to cut back other spending. Yeah, and I can show you similar charts about savings levels. So although it is true that debt levels for poor households are better than they were before the financial crisis, we care about the overall balance sheet as well, and their savings levels are also down. So the, um, and that's what happens if you have 10 years of a earning squeeze. Then the question is, why focus on it now? The Resolution Foundation could have focused on this 10 years ago. Well, it's always good not to be left out of a conversation. Everybody else is talking about recessions. This is showing you a, a chart of Google searches in the UK for recessions over the last 
uh, two years. This is obviously slightly flippant, but the, um, but there is a significant uptick in people looking for it, and they can't. They don't all just work in kind of the Bank of England and the Treasury. Some of these people are in the country. They started talking about it, and they've probably got good reason for talking about it. This chart is showing you a simple model we've done at the Resolution Foundation, saying what from previous. This is ba this is largely based on the yield curve. What from previous recessions. Uh, uh, is the chance of one today, and it gets you to roughly 40%. Ignore the number, because these things are all made up. Just focus on the point. It is, it is the highest it's been since the financial crisis. That's it. And that's not a surprise to any of you, because you, we've got a global uh, growth slowdown combining with uh, Brexit uncertainty. So it's very serious. Now, uh, just to wrap up there, I just want to say four things about the way in which we're intending to engage in this macro policy debate at the Resolution Foundation, because there's lots of ways to do this, good and bad. The first is to say, this is forward-looking. Now, one of the dangers of the macro policy debate of the last 10 years is that we had a very, very large row about the role of fiscal policy in 2012, and lots of people have stopped talking. That's all anyone's talked about for the last eight years. Okay? Now, people can come, reasonable people can come to different views about what we should and shouldn't have done in the past. But if that's all we talk about, it's not clear to me you get the optimal policy descriptions for the future. The second is to say that macro policy debates are incredibly US-focused. So there's lots of policy, particular policy-focused debates in the US about this. Peterson, other you know, friends of ours in Washington who do great work around that. Lots of people from the Fed have left the Fed and had lots of interesting things to say. But a lot of what they have to say is about the US context. And that cannot be the only thing we look at. Countries are different. The um, third is to state the obvious, which is we're well aware that we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. So our objective is not to replicate lots of really good work happening in Britain and abroad on macro policy. There's loads of things we've drawn on heavily for this report today where there was no need to add anything to it. But there are gaps. So I'll forget, I'll, we'll talk, come to it in a second, but I'll give you a big gap. Nobody can tell us, uh, in a low interest rate environment, we clearly have to rely on the automatic stabilizers more, as we'll come to in a second. We didn't know whether they had got stronger or weaker when we started this project eight years after the financial crisis. All else it called lower rates, you want a stronger set of automatic stabilizers. So we're aiming to fill in the gaps, the things like that that matter for policymakers. That's what we are trying to do, not to replicate lots of existing work. And then the last thing is to say we're policy focused. So we're not, you know, the purpose of the charity is research that ch helps improve the world. It is not really interesting esoteric things, which I enjoy reading on a Friday night um, due to having bad tastes. The, um, and so everything we do has to be focused on policy change or policy improvement. So then just to conclude, we're aiming to help grow the macro debate in the UK. It is too small and it's too disconnected from policy. Um, it's about being policy engaged, but learning from lots of the really interesting work that is out there and too rarely gets into the Bank of England and the Treasury. We are focused on the UK because that is where the gap is. The, um, uh, today, we're going to offer you an assessment of where that macro framework is today. How does it look? How fit is it for purpose? And then offer some directions of travel for prescriptions to change. So to do those last two things, I'm just going to hand over to James Smith, our research director, to take you through the report. OK, thank you very much, Torsten. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's James Smith. I'm research director at Resolution Foundation and head of the MPU. Um, great to see so many of you here this morning. A lot of what we're trying to do here is spark a wider debate about macro policy. And I think you know, that's something that's really uh, crunched down and we don't talk about anywhere nearly enough for the reasons Torsten was just talking about. Um, before I get into the meat of this, let me abuse my position in the limelight to say a few thank yous. I'll echo Torsten's thank you to uh, the team putting this together, particularly to Stephanie um, uh, and to the uh, associates for the MPU, including uh, Jan and Kate, who are speaking today, and to, to our other speakers. Um, I'd like to thank um, Torsten and our uh, Deputy Chief Exec, Matt Whitaker for having the vision for identifying the need to talk more about macro policy. That's a big thing, and it's something we need to do more of, and they've had the perseverance to, to push through uh, creating this, uh, the MPU. Um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Theresa May. Uh, sorry, I'm going, going on before I even start. Finally, I'd like to thank Theresa May. So basically, our strategy has been to launch this paper once Brexit was completely out of the way and the country was ready for a grown-up uh, conversation about macro policy. I think we can all agree that strategy has worked absolutely fabulously and uh, nobody really talks about Brexit anymore, so that's, that's all good. But the original timetable for this was to publish in April 
um, uh, after Brexit was out of the way. And now, um, with it being pushed back, we've just published it quite a lot later. So what was a comprehensive review of the framework is now an extremely comprehensive review. So as you're wading through the 100 pages, you can, you can thank Theresa May for, for that. All right, let me stop uh, prattling on and get into the meat of this. And let me try and be very clear about what we're doing in this paper. So basically, Torsten has told you there's a high risk of recession, and there's a good reason for thinking the recession could be particularly painful uh, this time, particularly for the most vulnerable in society. So straight away, you can see there's a very strong case for making sure we're ready and making sure the framework is, is ready for that. Um, and so what we've done is gone through each major area of policy. So we're going to go through monetary policy first, and macro policy, policy, uh, and then fiscal policy, and assess exactly how uh, effective we think it's likely to be uh, in, a, in a future recession. We're going to focus on targets, tools, governance, uh, and think about exactly uh, how things could be re reformed going forward. Um, and this is a very Bank of England style uh, approach to uh, to um, doing a presentation, so you can you can take a boy out of the Bank of England, but uh, you you can't separate him from from doing tables in a presentation. So I'm going to build this table up of our assessment and exactly what our our priorities are for the uh, for the reform agenda. Um, all right. Um, before I do that, let me let me be let me set the scene a little bit by showing you what happened during the financial crisis. Um, so this chart just shows a blue line, simple line of GDP during the financial crisis. Financial crisis was a huge recession. GDP fell more than 6%. More than a million people became unemployed. What I'm here to tell you today is that that all could have been much, much worse. So this red line shows a counterfactual that we have put together, which basically suggests that without the support of monetary policy and fiscal policy, uh, the recession would have been much, much worse. And um, we estimate here that the impact on GDP would have been an additional 12% hit here, which is obviously um, extremely bad and could have been much worse. I, I wouldn't want you to take the red line too literally. It's been constructed very simply by combining published estimates of the Bank of England with a simple ready reckoner for the size of fiscal impacts. But the key point, there are two key points from this. One is that macro policy is very important in recessions. It has an important role in terms of heading off recessions, but it, um, you can't recession-proof the economy. So you need, it, and it really comes into its own when you're actually in a recession and it cushions the economy. So macro policy is extremely important, but the other thing to keep in mind about this is that two thirds of the support um, uh, that we have implicitly in this blue line is coming from monetary policy. Um, so the cutting of rates and the, um, uh, the expansion of QE, that made a huge difference to the economy. Um, but the, but the, the problem is, um, uh, and that, that really reflected how we were thinking about macro policy at that time. So the sort of hubris of the great stability led us to think that we had this whole macro policy thing completely sussed and that um, monetary policy should just support the economy and fiscal policy should be concerned with debt sustainability. And that, that, that in, a, in a way, worked fine in, in that, um, at that period. But the problem is we can't pull the same trick again. Now, um, I think you know, this is something that will be familiar to most of you. Um, but, um, and there's lots of ways that I can show you this. And in the paper, we get into this in, in quite a few different ways, looking at multipliers, that kind of thing. But I think this is the really the simplest way of me to show, show you that um, monetary policy is not going to be able to, uh, to, to do the same, the same thing. And it basically, this chart basically shows that in the sort of gray areas where we've had recessions, um, a key part of the policy response has been big cuts in interest rates. And actually, the average cut in, in recessions has been about five percentage points. And if you look to the right of this chart, you, um, as you will know, interest rates are currently, uh, policy rates of the Bank of England are currently below 1%. So there's obviously much, much less um, scope for, uh, for cutting, uh, for cutting these, these interest rates. And um, you know, this, the, the sort of key reason for this is the sort of global low interest rate environment. So it's not just the UK um, that's in, the, in this position, it's, it's lots of other countries too. 
And for us, a key, a key part of this is sparking a wider debate about how we approach this constraint would, uh, would really benefit from wide acknowledgement of this problem. That would really uh, trigger uh, more of a, more of a, a debate. So a, a key thing for us is to acknowledge this constraint on, on uh, conventional monetary policy. And in fact, if I, um, if I show you the sort of um, uh, the extent to which you might think of that policy rate constraint binding, um, and here I've just done that by layering on the distribution of three year changes in policy rates on top of the OIS curve. It basically shows that more than 50% of the distribution of those changes is below zero. Now, this is not exactly the right way to, to think about um, uh, how often uh, uh, monetary policy would be constrained, but it is one way of looking at it. So in, if interest rates moved anything like or if interest rates should move anything like how they have in the past, then um, where we are now today means that much policy is going to be constrained a very high proportion of the time. And that basically, uh, basically the, 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 this, this, this issue implies a very strong argument for raising the inflation target. And essentially doing that should push up these rates um, essentially one for one. And you shift up that distribution, distribution so that less of it appears below zero and less of the um, and less of the constraint is is binding so you know that's a um, that would be a key way to ease constraints in the future the problem is you can't easily do that and you certainly can do that in a recession uh, the experience of Japan has showed us that um, changing uh, an inflation target or trying to re-anchor inflation expectations when uh, you're in a, um, a dire economic situation to begin with is is a pretty tricky thing to do you might say, well, ah, you know, well, we've found other ways of easing policy when uh, when policy rates hit the lower bound. Didn't the bank do? Didn't the Bank of England do QE? Didn't that help support the economy? Well, that's that's right. And our our basic our basic view is that QE worked. Um, it eased the lower bound constraints. It boosted the economy, um, and that was um, extremely helpful during the um, during the financial crisis. Um, but the, the, the problem is um, QE, uh, QE became um, less, less popular, if you like. Um, so um, a key concern was around the overall distributional effects. Because the key transmission mechanism of QE is to boost asset prices, lower the yield on those assets, and thereby loosen financial conditions. And the criticism and accusation that was leveled on QE was that it only helps the, the most wealthy. Um, our view is that, that that's too simple a critique of QE. Yes, we find in detailed work in this report that the distributional um, effect of wealth uh, from QE um, exacerbated those, those existing inequalities in terms of wealth. So 40% of the asset price increases that we saw for QE accrued to the top 10%. But um, they were offsetting effects in terms of um, in terms of the in terms of income inequality and this chart just shows across distribution our estimate of the impact on incomes from the better macro um, macro situation that, that came from from implementing QE and we can see the red bars is employment effect blue bars is a, a wage effect and here you can see because people were more likely to be made unemployed at the bottom of the distribution the effect is slightly larger there so there's some offsetting effect from, um, from uh, uh, on in income inequality. But our view is that the bar has probably gone up for doing more QE. And this is one way that we would, we would sort of show that. So basically, this is a survey of MPs, uh, members of parliament, that we commissioned at the Resolution Foundation to gauge their views on QE. And basically, the way to read this chart is the blue line asks about their, their views on the, on the past impact, and the, goal, and the orangey line looks at their views on the, on the future impact. Um, and basically, you, uh, things to the right are um, uh, signaling more approval, more positive about the effect of QE. As you move to the left, it's less, you're less positive about the impact of QE. And basically, what you see here is um, MPs being very positive about the past impact, 
uh, but more circumspect about the impact in future. So uh, barely a third of uh, MPs would say that future use of QE is, is advisable uh, going forward. And really for us, this, this implies a case for easing some of these constraints on QE, making it easier to use, regularizing it within the framework. And we set out some ways to do that in the paper. Um, but the problem with QE and a lot of other substitutes for uh, conventional bank rate policy is that they work by lowering longer term interest rates. And this chart just shows you a long time series across um, advanced economies of 10 year government bond yields. So the type of thing that QE is exactly trying to target. And I focused here on the UK and you can see those rates have really crunched down um, over the past couple of years and in recent months. And in the, in the paper, we argue that you could potentially do um, an additional um, QE stimulus in a recession that would be worth around uh, uh, the equivalent of around one percentage point on policy rates. But I think with um, interest rates at levels like this, even that is looking uh, quite optimistic. So let me return you to my assessment chart here. So basically, our view on monetary policy, as a lot of people have said, is that it, it will be constrained in a, few, um, in a recession. Um, that implies a very strong argument for raising the uh, inflation target. When I, when I hear the Bank of England say equilibrium rates are low, I hear and potentially we should have a, a higher inflation target. Um, just to, just to be absolutely clear, we think um, the Bank of England plays a key role in our overall framework. So both in terms of what it's done since the crisis, in terms of its overall role and the uh, support it gave during the crisis, um, we think a strong independent Bank of England is a, um, is a, is a really crucial part of the overall framework. Um, but um, uh, looking, so looking forward, um, we think it'd be really helpful to acknowledge the constraints um, that uh, monetary policy is facing to spark a wider debate, strengthen QE, regularize it within the framework, and then review the monetary policy toolkit. Now there's lots of changes you could make here and uh, lots of countries are, are conducting review of their tools and strategies for monetary policy. Our sense is, those additional tools and strategies that people often talk about, different types of asset prices, different types of forward guidance policies, are not going to give you all that much in an environment where low rates are basically um, at very low levels. So there's an obvious lower bound that people talk about on policy rates, but there's a lower bound on longer term rates as well, which people talk less about. And that implies a very strong case for, uh, for raising the inflation target. Um, let me very briefly say on macro pru, uh, we don't see that um, as the answer to this problem. Macro pru has been a key addition to the overall framework. It's very important in terms of addressing issues in terms of risk from the financial cycle, but it's not well suited to playing a large scale role in managing overall demand um, in the economy because it has that um, direct targeting of the financial system. So using it in large scale um, would would potentially be distortionary for the for the financial system, and I think um, you know the, it would be part of a, a, a policy response, but not not um, a way of easing easing constraints on monetary policy. Um, so if we can't do Plan A, which is uh, monetary policy, uh, what what should our Plan B be? Um, so. Our, our answer to this, and I think a lot of people have come to similar conclusions, is fiscal policy really needs to be more active in, in recessions in supporting the economy. Um, now, the, question is, the interesting question is how. So a lot of people stop there and say fiscal policy should do more, but the big question is how. And that's where I think we add a lot more than, than some of the other contributions to, uh, to this debate. And um, I'm going to answer or give you our view on how it should be done by, uh, with reference to three straw men uh, opinions on how you should conduct fiscal policy uh, in this sort of environment. And before I go on, I know these aren't straw men, they're scarecrows, but this is the closest, closest thing that I could get. All right, our, our sort of first, the first view um, uh, is that uh, fiscal policy just won't be able to help here. 
It all but ignores the cycle. Um, the framework isn't set up. The Treasury aren't set up to do fiscal policy. Uh, we, you know, the, the situation is basically hopeless. Um, we're certainly not in, in that camp. And this, this chart basically shows you um, time series of the debt and deficits during, uh, during uh, past recessions. If you focus to the right on um, the deficit during the financial crisis, you can see the results of a really uh, big um, e uh, expansionary fiscal policies. And this is a combination of um, discretionary measures like cutting VAT, but it's also a combination of the automatic stabilizers. So lower tax take, higher benefit spend that's helping to support the economy. And the key thing with, with the current framework to keep in mind is that basically it has this knockout in it that allows you to say, look, we've been hit by a significant negative shock, um, so we can just suspend the rules and do discretionary fiscal policy. And that's essentially what, what happened during the crisis and uh, um, you know, fiscal policy uh, help to, to support the economy. So you might think, well, hang on a sec. Um, you just told me fiscal policy works pretty well in this situation. Um, maybe there's no problem here. Um, well, we certainly don't take that, that view either. And uh, we think um, uh, what is needed is a significant updating um, of the framework. And let me try and, uh, try and explain to you um, exactly, exactly why that is. And basically for us, it's not that fiscal policy doesn't recognize the cyclical needs of the economy. It's that it doesn't recognize it in a way that's explicit within the framework. So it's all very implicit. There's this knockout, and you can jump to a position where you're um, doing fiscal policy by suspending the rules. Um, and we think that would um, reduce the size, the speed, and the effectiveness of the overall fiscal, fiscal impact. Now. Um, uh, bearing in mind that we, we don't want to um, rehearse history too much, let me try and explain to you why that is by looking at the stances of fiscal and monetary policy um, through uh, the past sort of 20 years or so. And the way to read this chart is as the, um, I'm actually going to use a laser pointer here, as, as um, oh, well, that's not worked. Um, but <laughs> as, as the chart, as the chart becomes more negative, so as these blue lines, uh, the blue line, red line go more negative, uh, there's more that signals um, that fiscal policy in the red line and monetary policy in the blue line is, is supporting growth, doing more to support the economy. And you can basically see in the crisis um, a very sharp loosening of both fiscal and monetary policy. Um, but if you look after the crisis, uh, fiscal policy quite soon turned back to being broadly neutral, whereas monetary policy stayed at, at uh, broadly the same level. Now, I don't want to take you to take this too literally in terms of exactly how you would measure the stance of these things, but I think this is a, a decent broad description of what, um, what happened during that period. And by the way, this is not just a UK phenomenon. This was happening all over the world. Central banks were the only game in town, and fiscal policy was um, uh, essentially um, tightening in, in a lot of places. And this basically reflects this sort of pre-crisis framework. The monetary policy looks after the economy, fiscal policy looks after, uh, after debt sustainability. And for us, the problem is if you, if, you, um, if you had a recession today, essentially the blue line can't go any lower. So the red line would have to A, uh, become much more negative and probably proportionally more negative than it did during the crisis. And it would have to be very persistently negative in this chart. So you'd have to uh, hold that fiscal stimulus for much, much longer. And for us, the problem is if you don't have an explicit role for that in the framework, people don't understand that you're going to do that. So the public and financial markets think that you're, uh, when you um, jettison your rules as you enter the recession, um, expectations about what fiscal policy would do become totally unmoored and unanchored. And we think that the framework really needs an explicit role for fiscal policy that makes it clear that you're going to perform that role during recession and that you're going to have a credible plan for making sure that you respond and have run tight of fiscal policy later. So, that, that, so, so we think if there was a recession, fiscal policy response would be too small um, in, under the current setup. We also think um, that that triggering of the uh, of the significant negative shock can slow things down, 
and we think that the lack of clarity around the framework could mean that it's not, um, it's not work, it doesn't work in expectations. People don't understand fiscal policy is going to do what, uh, going to perform that role, so it becomes less effective. The other thing to make clear is that, um, uh, you know, having uh, having less of a focus on the cyclical part of fiscal policy, not having an explicit part, has um, brought a little bit out of um, uh, out of the main sort of fiscal policy part of it, the, um, the automatic stabilizers. So there's a, a lot of new work in this paper that looks at the strength of the automatic stabilizers. There's a strong case for strengthening automatic stabilizers when um, monetary policy is, is constrained at the lower bound. We actually find um, that um, the automatic stabilizers have been weakened, if anything. And you can see the key reason for that on this chart, which basically shows that some of the benefits that are um, incredibly powerful in stabilizing the economy during recession have actually been made somewhat uh, less generous during the, during the recession. Okay, and my, my final straw man is that um, we're just not being radical enough. Like we, we should, um, what, what should happen here is that fiscal policy needs to be fi money financed, and that's the only way to do a fiscal response. Um, our view is basically that um, we wouldn't rule that out. There are circumstances where you might get there, but that's not remotely where we are today. This chart just gives you a sense of that. So I would focus on the red line here, which is debt servicing. And you can see even though debt um, in the blue line has increased, debt servicing is at incredibly low levels by um, historical standards. And so there must be obvious capacity to, uh, to undertake debt finance fiscal policy in the next recession. So we have the fiscal capacity, uh, we should use it. And even more than that, um, the UK is in a, a, a good position for doing this relative to some other countries because our actual process for deciding on fiscal policy um, is um, not as slow and doesn't get in the way as it does for um, some other countries, including the US here on the left and on the right, Germany have had sort of similar constraints and in Europe, uh, there's the other constraint of there not being one fiscal actor. So the UK is in a, in a much better position here, essentially. All right, so, so that's where we've got to on uh, fiscal policy. So fiscal policy, fiscal policy's cyclical role needs to be expanded. It needs to be made, uh, it, at the moment, it's implicit, which reduces the timeliness, effectiveness, and the size of the overall st stimulus. The automatic stabilizers have been weakened. Um, and our view is traditional fiscal policy um, uh, is, is available here. Um, uh, in terms of the priorities here then, the, the key things are to uh, rewrite the fiscal rules to give it that explicit uh, kind of cyclical role, um, strengthen the automatic stabilizers and prepare uh, discretionary stimulus. So doing stimulus in a way that um, it gets your biggest bang for your buck and uh, takes into account the types of vulnerabilities that Torsen was talking about earlier in terms of those on, uh, on lower incomes, uh, we think is incredibly important. All right, that's it from me. I'm just gonna leave you with our taglines here in terms of, uh, in terms of our overall assessment. Stephanie, over to you. <laughs> well, you've got uh, the others on this panel. You've got some great practitioners, uh, current and past, of both monetary and fiscal policy. I'm not speaking as a practitioner. I'm speaking as an economist, but also as an observer and uh, a journalist. And I can't help thinking, I mean, this is a fantastic bit of work, but not just this morning, but in lots of different venues. We're now talking much more about the need for more collaboration between monetary and fiscal policy. And it feels like everything is moving in the direction of more cooperation between monetary and fiscal authorities, except um, the world itself. Um, and I would just, as a, as a journalist, inject a note of caution about not so much what's in this report, but it's in general our kind of grand schemes for, for new ways of doing uh, macro in response to the next crisis. But we do have a US president who is currently declaring the central bank, its own cent his own central bank is the biggest threat to the economy and, quote, doesn't have a clue. Um, relations actually between the bank and the treasury at the moment are not particularly uh, strong and in the public arena have been quite fraught in the last few years. So I just think that in many ways, and on a more serious note, I think that the factors that have brought us to this place in terms of 
what the post-crisis growth outlook has been, what policy has done, have also made relations between those two authorities unusually fraught, not just here, but around the world. And we should, I guess, remember that as we come up with our wonderful ways of doing it. Um, I do think this is a great contribution to those debates that we're all having, because if only to remind people that before we make this jump to ever more elaborate schemes for monetary financing and helicopters and this and all the things that people are usefully putting into the public domain over the last uh, few weeks and, and months, you know, there is quite a lot of traditional plain old vanilla fiscal policy available and maybe we don't have to jump to those new things before we've explored that, the strength of that capacity. So that was one thing I really liked um, about this report. I also... Uh, particularly like the focus on automatic stabilizers, having at various times when I was at the BBC and other times, tried to write things and say things about the automatic stabilizers. And as a few, you know, Ed is nodding, Ed Cormier is nodding in the audience. You, uh, basic facts about the economy, you go back and you find, you know, the 10 years old OECD estimates of the automatic stabilizers. And even the, just the question of, do we have stronger ones than other countries? is either impossible to answer or answerable only within a five or 10 year lag. So I think even, you haven't even come up with the answer with this report, it's telling that you're only able to say, speculate um, with reasonably good justification that um, the stabilizers have gone down, but we don't actually uh, know. I would say, um, especially when you look at that chart, uh, given what you rightly say about uh, the pattern of, uh, costs, economic costs for the recession, for the last recession, and how it actually differed, the distributive consequences relative to previous recessions, you might, you want to also focus on the in-work benefits and what's happened to them. Because if we think that a large part of reducing the employment impact of the crisis was, in effect, pricing people into work with that big squeeze on real wages across the economy, so you didn't have a small number of people hit with no income who were then relying on the unemployment benefits, but lots of people relatively speaking, moving down the income scale and needing those in-work benefits more. Um, I think we just, you, you need you to focus to on those as well, because it's, and they, of course, we know that there's been a, a big, um, a, a lot of the reductions in benefits have been in-work um, families, and I can't help thinking that that would affect our ability as an economy to have that more broadly distributed uh, economic pain that we had in a good way uh, in the last um, crisis. Uh, I also think, and it's something that uh, Torsten and I have, have talked about in the past, you know, just the, the recognition um, of how much more seriously policymakers in the future are going to need to take the distributive consequences of both monetary and fiscal sides of the response. Um, you know, if anything, I would say more about that. I mean, the Bank of England has been quite, I mean, understandably, but very defensive uh, on the subject of the... Um, Income, the distributive consequences of, of QE, you go into it in the report. Uh, whatever the, whatever the tr reality is, particularly on the income side, which I think is clearly right, um, that income inequality was not necessarily increased as a result of QE and probably reduced, um, people understand the wealth argument pretty well. You know, they can see money being created and being in, given to people who already have money, because that's the mechanism you're putting it into asset prices. Um, so I think there has to, I don't think that certainly uh, if you talk to people at the Fed, their understanding of this issue, but I think haven't completely internalised how much more scrutiny there will be on the monetary response to the next um, crisis. And it really is important. If we think we're now dealing with some very economic, even just from an economic standpoint, if we're dealing with the economic costs um, of uh, people's distrust of, of capitalism and the kind of and the kind of politics that that's created uh, in part as a result of the response to the, the the way the crisis happened and then the way the crisis was responded to you know if if macro policy tools play a, played a part in that which I think they did I think QE has played a part though maybe not a large part um, that's something we have to be even more uh, conscious of because we can't afford to be increasing those forces in the way we respond to the next crisis. So I think I think the focus is on exactly the right stuff, and I was rather, um, you know, envious as I sat on a plane reading this of you know how nice that to be able to have the resources. You know, it's fantastic the Resolution Foundation has the 
brain space and the capacity to really focus on some of these questions that people haven't focused on. But I, I do, when I kind of reflected on the content, I thought it's also made me more clear on how incredibly messy and difficult it's going to be to learn the lessons in this report. So if you just think about the uh, macro framework that the UK has, um, we've learned you know, that, that one of the big takeaways, which is right, we should be reflecting better the fact that we shouldn't be putting all the owners for timeliness on the, on the Bank of England. You know? uh, and you make the point that you know, monetary policy, we, it's been okay to have the most timely bit of our macro response be monetary policy because that was also supposed to take the, the majority of the burden. Uh, and if that's no longer the case, how do you incorporate the framework? That, that's absolutely right. It also, though, has to reflect how uh, we can no longer talk about macro policy without talking about politics and distributive consequences. So there's this sort of two things. You need to have more, um, you need all of policy to be sort of more timely and to accept that fiscal is going to have to play a big role. But you also have to accept that the whole response is going to be much more, we have to be much, not think we can separate macro from the micro. You know, it, we, this comes up again and again. And in practice, I think that's really tricky. I mean, there's a reason we haven't done, haven't done this before. Um, even just on the automatic stabiliser. Do you really take the politics out of tax and benefits by calling them automatic stabilisers? I mean, we might like to think so. Um, but there's a deep ideology, ideological fact element at play in how you think about in-work benefits and even more about out-of-work benefits. You might have a long-term view of the growth impact of out-of-work benefits being a certain level, which is completely in contradiction to having to maximising the stabilisers. So I don't think you can take the politics just by calling them automatic stabilisers. Um, can you meaningfully increase the timeliness of fiscal policy by making it part of the existing sort of short-term macro framework? And if so, how? I mean, and I was trying to think, what would it be? I mean, at the very least, I guess you could have a member of the OBR sitting on the MPC. I mean, I was trying to think of how, you know, the question has come down to, are you going to sort of infect the existing instrument or are you going to try and create something different, some kind of tripartite structure or anything else. And again, you know, the more I think about it, uh, the more I suspect, you know, the messiness of this stuff is why people prefer to talk about helicopters um, and sort of pure monetary financing of fiscal, because it feels like that's easier to do than to get into these messy areas. But I do think that's probably, um, it's probably illusory. But I mean, if you put it another way, it's about are we going to are we trying to are we trying to make fiscal policy more technocratic, and if so, how much? Or are we trying to make monetary policy more political? And weirdly, when you start thinking about the mechanism, it feels easier to make monetary policy more political to embed some of those choices in the monetary structure. But this is when I will then have Jan tell me why that would be absolutely disastrous. But I think that is why, going back to the beginning we've all ended up talking about monetary financing because really trying to apply all of this stuff to, to fiscal policy, making it more automatic, more timely, is going to be really difficult. Great. I think. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, but as I am... Um, one of the main takeaways from the, like, whatever, however long it is now, 18 months of work on this, is that we don't choose the world we live in. The world we live in is much messier than we thought it was 12 years ago, and I think the onus is on all of us to decide what are the bits of the old world that matter most, because you can't have it all, uh, basically. Yeah. Anyway, right, from Stephanie to uh, Jan, I'm sorry she's just given your job away to the OBR, but <laughs> bad things happen, and unemployment benefits have gone down, but they're still generous. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you, Dorsa. No, we're putting him in charge of the OBR. Uh, don't, try and, don't try and get out of it now. <laughs> you gave his job away. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, Jan. Um, so the idea behind <coughs> today's report is that when the next recession hits. Interest rates might not be that far from their effective lower bound, which would give us less scope than we've had historically to cut policy rates significantly. And policymakers, therefore, have to think about other policy tools to stimulate the economy in the next recession. Um, and there's kind of four big ideas in there that I just want to unpack uh, for a minute. So the first one is, why might interest rates still be near historically low levels the next time a recession hits? And the second one is, what determines quite how low interest rates can go. And the third one is what other tools are available to monetary policymakers 
And then finally, what tools are available outside the sphere of monetary policy? Before I get into those four things, um, I just want to emphasize that I'm talking here about a hypothetical recession at some unspecified point in the future. <laughs> But I, I'm say, I say this for a very specific reason, which is that I, I don't subscribe to the view that we are somehow overdue a recession simply because the last one was more than a decade ago. I do, however, subscribe to the view that all economies are prone to occasional recessions at irregular frequencies. We don't necessarily see them coming, uh, and we definitely don't anticipate their severity with any kind of precision, and so it's prudent to think about what would happen when another one hits. So first, why might interest rates still be near historically low levels the next time a recession hits? Um, during my four years on the MPC, this has been the subject of many of my speeches. Uh, I've highlighted various mechanisms that result in interest rates being persistently lower than they have been in the decades before the financial crisis. And several years ago, I summarized these forces as the three Ds. So I emphasized debt deleveraging pressures with high levels of debt globally, in some cases public, in some cases private, which act as a headwind to demand and increase downside risk, both of which act to depress real interest rates. I've also talked about demographics, in particular increased longevity without a commensurate increase in the retirement age, which drives increased desired savings, and in particular, savings into safe assets. And then I've discussed the distribution of income, which in many countries have shifted towards those with a higher propensity to save. So in summary, I do think there have been structural forces unrelated to monetary policy that are likely to keep real interest rates persistently lower. And a lot of recent research and also the evolution of the global economy in the last few years have only served to emphasize and broaden the evidence supporting this view. My second point is what determines the effect of lower bound on interest rates? So the reason there is any lower bound on nominal interest rates at all is because of the existence of paper money, which has a zero interest rate. So that means that banks will have an incentive to switch their reserves into paper money at low enough policy rates. And bank depositors will have an incentive to switch their bank deposits into paper money at low enough retail rates. But that's only part of the argument about why nominal interest rates have a floor. Because banks earn their profits by charging more for loans than they pay on deposits, there's a floor on loan rates, which is even higher than the floor on deposit rates. And if a central bank cuts interest rates so much that banks can no longer earn a sufficient spread between loan rates and deposit rates, because deposit rates cannot fall too far before people switch into paper money, one of two things will happen. Either banks will raise loan rates despite falling policy rates, or banks will stop making new loans because these are no longer profitable. Either way, the effect of lowering policy rates further becomes counterproductive. At the Bank of England, my colleagues concluded already in 2009, a decade ago, that even though technically interest rates can go negative, in practice, such low rates would become counterproductive. In academia, this later became known as the reversal rate, meaning the interest rate below which the impact of interest rates on the economy reverses. Now, where that reversal rate lies precisely differs across countries, and it depends on the structure of bank assets and bank liabilities. But the consensus on the MPC, and as well as my own view, is that for the UK, the reversal rate is close to, but above zero. So this analysis rules out the idea of taking interest rates negative in the next downturn, unless we abolish paper currency, which I'm not in favor of, as I've stated on the record before. So if you combine that with the analysis that suggests that the neutral nominal interest rate is probably only somewhere in a 1% to 3% range, it means that it is very unlikely we'll be able to cut interest rates by as much as we have done in previous recessions, which the report shows was about five percentage points. So the third point is then to ask what other tools, other than cutting the policy rate to its effective lower bound, are available to monetary policy makers. We can buy more assets, both public and private, both of which we've done already. There are practical limits to how many tradable assets we can buy, which are related to not wanting to hold too large a share of a single instrument in order to preserve liquidity. But there are also limits to the effective stimulus imparted by such purchases. 10-year government bond yields in the UK are around half a percent right now. There is just not that much room for these yields to fall further. In the limit, once the policy rate hits its effective lower bound and is expected to stay there for many years, buying even more government bonds 
is unlikely to provide significant further stimulus. Much depends, of course, <coughs> on where those expectations of the path of policy will be when the next recession hits. And the point that there is not that much room for a further fall in government bond yields also applies to corporate bond spreads, which are also already quite low. Now again, heading into the next recession, there's a chance, of course, that they would be higher, but at the moment, there's a limit to how much monetary policy can be expected to compress them. So in conclusion, on both interest rates and unconventional monetary policy, there is more we can do, but I believe that the total monetary firepower is less than we had in the period leading up to previous recessions. So that leaves policies that fall outside the sphere of monetary policy and its current mandate. Now distinguish two different avenues here. One is to change the mandate for monetary policy, and the other one is to look to fiscal policy. Now, given my position as an MPC member who has been given the mandate by the government to achieve a 2% inflation target, I'm going to be brief here. Just note that the logic of a possible change in the inflation target is quite straightforward. If there is an effective floor on nominal interest rates, and the objective is to make real interest rates fall more, one possible solution is to try and push inflation expectations higher. This can be done permanently by changing the inflation target, or temporarily by moving to a price level target or an inflation averaging framework, which would involve a period of higher inflation until some specific conditions are met. <coughs> uh, these solutions are actively being discussed in academia and among policymakers in other countries. And there are downsides, of course, for example, related to the fact that if you change the inflation target, there might be a higher perceived risk that you're going to change it again in the future, which is another way of saying that inflation expectations might be less well anchored around the higher target. Like I said, it's not appropriate for me to express a view on whether the pros of that decision outweigh the cons, but I think it's a debate well worth having outside the MPC. The second avenue is fiscal policy, and that can either be what I would call plain vanilla fiscal policy, which means increasing spending or cutting taxes, financed by increased government borrowing, or it can be a joint monetary fiscal expansion, so-called helicopter money, where the additional government spending is financed by a permanent and irreversible gift from the central bank, rather than a loan, as is implicitly the case uh, with QE. And I would note that helicopter money is quite a radical option, while plain vanilla fiscal policy, especially in a low interest rate environment, is not. I think it's useful to consider two cases of helicopter money. One is where the central bank pays interest on reserves. The other one is where it doesn't. If the central bank pays interest on reserves, helicopter money is just really a fiscal expansion financed by interest-bearing reserves. I don't think this is interestingly or usefully different from plain vanilla fiscal expansion. But if the central bank does not pay interest on reserves, helicopter money becomes quite a radical policy option. By mechanically keeping rates stuck at zero, the reserve expansion effectively suspends, for a period, both the instrument and the target of the central bank. It therefore expect, effectively suspends, for a period, central bank operational independence. I think Central bank operational independence has served us extremely well in keeping inflation low and inflation expectations anchored. In the post-Lehman decade, which was a far more tumultuous decade than the previous one, UK inflation still averaged 2.1%, which is very close to the 2% target. And inflation volatility was 1.3%. On the other hand, in the period between World War II and the beginning of operational central bank independence, Inflation averaged 6.2% with a volatility of 4.8%. So before we as a country give up central bank operational independence, even for a period, I think we should make sure that we try everything else first. And I think today's report by the Resolution Foundation provides a great list of options. Thank great. you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. So James will be very happy because that means that we've, he's already ticked the first one on his list of policy recommendations, which policymakers should note it's not looking too rosy. They, we didn't actually say it in the slides, but we do actually provide a quantification in the um, report of how much monetary policy could do relative to what you might need in an average recession, the, um, and it comes in about a quarter 
now, not everyone will endorse that particular number, but it's about a quarter of the support you would need in an average recession, just to say how this constraint is not marginal. You can't have like 95% of what you want and then kind of, oh, well, I'll suck up the 5%. Right, Kate. Okay, thank you. Um, you seem to have lined up a lot of speakers, and I think people are really looking forward to asking questions, so I'll try and be relatively brief, although it is quite nice to be able to think about something other than Brexit, although it's quite useful to think that we've probably all got Brexit in the back of our minds when we're thinking about how the next recession might come about. Um, and that's worth dwelling on when you think about the fact that recessions come in very different shapes and sizes. I think this paper is very good. It tackles an important issue, and I agree with the basic point that the framework hasn't kept up. And I also very much agree with the point that's already been made, that the world is inevitably messy. When I think back on the framework, I, I didn't actually read the um, Balls O'Donnell book that sort of laid out the framework for the Labour government until after the Labour government had gone, and indeed after I'd left the MPC. Perhaps I should have read it earlier. And it struck me when I read it with 2020 hindsight, such a marvellous thing. It had two big weaknesses. One is it didn't really think about the risk of financial crisis. This, they were not you. That unique in this, many of us underplay the risk of financial crisis. Perhaps less excusably, it didn't actually say very much about the risk of a shock to the economy that would send you off course that came from abroad, hardly mentions abroad actually through the whole, through the whole book. And that meant it was actually a framework for little economic disturbances. And I quite often talk about the early years of my time on the MPC as a small change of monetary policy. And even now, I think we would all agree that small disturbances in the economy are dealt with perfectly adequately by monetary policy. So we need to be clear that we're putting this framework in place for really significant problems or smaller problems where monetary policy, for one reason or another, and Jan's taken us through all that, um, is out of space, is, is, out, of, is out of shots. Um, there is, of course, a question about whether the bank is out of shots. You, you mentioned the possibility of buying up corporate debt, and of course it's perfectly true that in the next recession we might see a widening in spreads, in which case buying corporate debt might turn out to be useful. And when I was on the MPC, and I've heard him say this since, Charlie Bean used to argue that there's almost infinite scope because the bank could simply go on and buy up all the assets in the economy, although I have a feeling that somehow public confidence would have collapsed before we'd reached the end of that uh, exercise, but it is worth thinking that um, you know, there is little, always a little bit more you can do. Three points I think I'd make. I think it's good to have some principles established in advance, but I think it's also good to be wary of tying them too tightly. Part of the reason I think this is that we have to think about what is going to be the source of the next couple of um, big shocks. I've already, of course, referred to the thing we're not supposed to be talking about. But actually thinking back to the Balls O'Donnell book, they just didn't foresee the way in which the large shock would, would come about. And therefore, any policy response is going to have to be flexible because I'm pretty well prepared to say we don't really know quite what the next shock will be look like. And also, when we have recessions, we do need to make this fundamental distinction between um, shocks that come about through um, difficulties with supply, which actually may be the dominant feature of the next recession, and shocks that come about through, um, shock, through shocks of demand. In more extreme circumstances, I think you you therefore do have to ask the question, which policy should bear the brunt? Now, actually, it's fisc the fiscal authorities, in some sense, are the ones who answer this question, because the way in which the structure of our policy works, of course, is that monetary policy is in, I know we all talk about as terribly timely, but in some sense, it is the second mover, because you set monetary policy against the background of what you understand to be the fiscal, um, fiscal authorities' intentions, and they, in theory, set uh, fiscal policy in the knowledge of what your reaction function is going to be. So it is possible to think of negative shocks, perhaps a negative shock that affects particular sectors of the economy, not the financial sector, in which actually fiscal policy should bear the brunt of an adjustment. I want to argue against the idea that fiscal policy should always be the last resort in a crisis. I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily right. However, much as I'd like to use fiscal policy, I agree with... Stephanie, that trying to think about what the practicalities are of using fiscal policy is really important. Um, one of the um, jobs that I do at the moment is I chair a bizarre organisation called the Jersey Fiscal Policy Panel. Now, Jersey is a tiny place. It's a bit like giving advice to a sort of medium-sized town council, except, of course, the medium-sized town council have a government to fall back on, and Jersey really has 
nothing much to fall back on. And of course, it doesn't have its own monetary policy. It's, um, so fiscal policy literally is its only game in town. When I arrived on the fiscal policy panel, I inherited from the previous people on the fiscal policy panel. By the way, it's always full of people who've been MPC members, obviously, deciding that we'll try and extend our wishes. And they said, as I know other people say, that any fiscal intervention in a crisis should be timely, targeted, and temporary, and had left the view that this was best done by capital projects. Now, I've now been advising Jersey for five and a half years, and during the whole of that five and a half years, they've had that in their mind a really big capital project, which is building a new hospital. Sadly, they're further away today from laying a foundation stone because it's fall, fall, and foul of tremendous planning disputes. They were five and a half years ago when I joined, so timely, the new hospital certainly has, certainly has not been. And I think it is quite difficult to think of many capital projects um, where somehow you're ready to go, but it actually, it'd be fine. You can just wait for a recession before you do go. Infrastructure projects, it seems to me, on the whole, aren't, re aren't really like that. And actually, you, are, you do have to fall back on the other kinds of things you do in recessions, um, stamp duty, changes to VAT, and have the courage to know you can reverse them, which I think is, the, is, always, the really big, is always the really big challenge. I think the, as, as a sort of small challenge, if we'd known at the beginning that the um, recovery from the great financial crisis was going to be so slow and so protracted, we probably would have thought about infrastructure. But of course, it took quite a long time before any of us realised just what a long drag this was going to be. I want to say something brief about um, distribution, which of course really drives the Resolution Foundation. I, mean, I think it's true that QE had overall positive effects, but I think it's also true, and you bring this out very well, that there are winners and losers, particularly in terms of the timing of which people are getting into or out of the housing market. The difficulty is I think the impact of QE in terms of driving up asset prices has got confused in the public mind and possibly in the MP's mind with the big fall in global real rates, which of course has been a very large factor between pushing up asset prices and probably is not going to be reversed at any time soon, and that certainly raises issues for housing policy. Those of us who are very old, of course, will remember the 1970s in which we had periods of high inflation, which had really huge distributional effects, and that's why we don't like high inflation. And of course, that's in some sense why we had a central bank, and it's then sort of rather ironic that the central bank has then put in a policy that's proved to be um, distri have distribution effects in the other way. I want to say something very brief about central bank independence. I think you can be too pretty about central bank independence. Central bank independence is really important to stop um, policy makers at the other end of town doing things that will look good in the short term and in the long term are bad. In a recession, I don't think central bank independence matters very much. It ought to be the case that the two have every incentive to work together and to work together well. However, um, Stephanie is quite right to point out that in the US we have this tremendous row about the way in which the central bank is working and how independent it is or should be. I've been thinking about this a little bit here in the UK because, as many of you know, I've been uh, I'm on the interviewing panel for the next governor of the Bank of England, and one thing that strikes me about this, apart from the fact that it's a rather tricky time to be doing anything at the moment, is that if you're really appointing a governor for eight years, it's pretty difficult to foresee the political circumstances through that eight years and into which this person is going to have to play themselves. So it is important to have somebody who is going to be properly politically sensitive, not in the sense that they will give up central bank independence, but in the sense that they understand that the credibility of policy is best served by being politically sensitive. Almost finally, However good the framework is, policymakers will commit errors. One of the reasons that fiscal and monetary policy didn't work together terribly well in the aftermath of the financial crisis, as James's charts show, is that actually we thought we could solve it all with monetary policy, and that just turned out to be incorrect. Monetary policy did not get us to escape velocity. We're still hanging around waiting for this to come along. And really, um, finally, I think the point about distribution is incredibly, is incredibly important. If we are going to use fiscal policy more, getting the distribution right and thinking about distribution in advance, the nature of the shock, who it's going to affect, how we might offset that, that seems to me absolutely key. You can't fix that in advance. It's going to be sensitive to the circumstances. Great. Thank you, Kate.
it wasn't actually it wasn't actually on the recommendation list, but appoint good governor uh, would, would <laughs> is also heavily desirable. Right, <laughs> Rupert. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to make a few sort of small points responding to specific things in the report, and then kind of two. Uh, bigger points. Um, but first of all, I, do, I think this is an excellent report. I think it's very good that you've got an institution with the resources and credibility of the Resolution Foundation digging into this. Um, I think it's very timely. Uh, I know from experience that inevitably you know, large parts of the current framework are designed with the previous episode in mind, and that is always an error that policy is going to make. So we need to think creatively about how things might look differently in future. So congratulations. Um, just on a few sort of specific points, I, I you know, strongly agree we need to put a lot of effort into normalizing QE. I don't think we can take it for granted that QE is going to be as easy in the future as it was in the past. Uh, in theory, it should be. Uh, if you compare the UK particularly to the Eurozone and the US, you know, the, the Bank of England should be less constrained legally and politically than either of those two central banks, given developments in those areas. Um, I think it probably would be right now relatively unconstrained, but I think we can't predict, for example, if we have a change of government, if we have a uh, Jeremy Corbyn-led government, I think you might find all sorts of temptations to intervene in what the, the way the Bank of England can operate that we, we can't take for granted. So therefore, I think any work that we can do now in order to normalize QE, try and lock in the independence of the Bank of England to do whatever it can in terms of innovative policy along existing possibilities is, is important. Um, inflation, changing the inflation target. So we did review the monetary policy framework back in 2013, and we thought about all sorts of radical things. Um, it's speaking to politicians about raising inflation targets, they find that a very difficult thing to get their head around and how you would possibly communicate that to the public. Um, I think that that is going to be a very difficult uh, thing to get over. At the time, we decided also against trying to move in the direction of price level targeting or averaging. I do think things have moved on on that. I think the US is obviously leading the way. Um, I think that maybe there is scope for trying to move in that direction. Um, and. Again, I think the main challenges are communication challenges. You know, the simplicity of an inflation target and the way that leads into expectation formation is a big advantage. Trying to communicate to the public the way that that might change over time, I think, is a very big challenge. Um, on fiscal policy, which is where I think a, a lot of the action is going to be, um, I do agree that the fiscal rules probably should say something more about stabilization, the need for stabilization policy to be part of fiscal policy. I, I agree uh, with, with Kate that you can't be too prescriptive. I think you have to leave quite a big wide open blank box because, again, you just don't know what exactly the circumstances are going to be. Um, on the automatic stabilizers, again, really interesting. I totally agree with Stephanie and others that you know this is a big, slightly been an evidence-free zone for too long. Um, but I, and I also agree that we can't. You know what Stephanie referred to as sort of political um, issues around this are, are actually just straightforward economic trade-offs here. You know, so basically, higher automatic, sta bigger automatic stabilizers requires bigger replacement ratios, higher marginal tax rates. Uh, those help increase automatic stabilizers. Lots of arguments in micro policy suggest actually you should be you should want lower replacement ratios and, and lower marginal tax rates um, in order for structural reasons in order to you know, maximize employment. And that, that is just a straightforward trade-off. We can't get away from that. It's not political. It's inherent in the design. So maybe we should try and put some quantification around how beneficial it is to have automatic stabilizers. Are the likely scale of the benefits of increasing them likely to offset any cost in terms of structural impact? Um, I strongly agree uh, with Kate around expenditure projects. You know, the idea that there's a sort of pipeline of projects ready to be turned on is just not realistic. It's not just planning. It's also, you know, if we think about the UK right now, the constraints on capital expenditure in the UK right now in terms of government infrastructure spending are not the numbers that Sajid Javid wants to put in the Red Book. It's literally, it's basic things around, you know, skilled workforce people who are qualified to build railways and roads and hospitals and you know a lot of other institutions doing this are literally stretched to the max the idea that you could sort of suddenly increase this in a in a recession i think is unrealistic i think there are some areas where we need to think about capital spending currently undertaken by the private sector where if that fell off dramatically in a in a recession the government could step in i think housing is the most obvious one of those where you could imagine something that is currently largely private sector provision falling off a cliff in a recession having government mechanisms ready to either either through local authorities or through some of the pilots that are happening at the moment about direct government uh, uh, purchasing of housing, even housing for sale, uh, 
so that there's a kind of commissioning body to keep the overall level of health building in place. I think that would be one way you could do that. I think realistically, going back over what has worked in previous recessions, you know, VAT is your big lever. Um, and so, you know, the idea that anything is going to be more powerful than that, I think, is, is unrealistic, plus a lot of other smaller things. Um, so those are sort of some small, sort of smaller comments. Uh, two big points, one about monetary financing and then about um, the importance of micro responses in recessions. Um, on monetary financing, so partly, uh, you know, this is uh, topical for me because BlackRock published a, a paper recently by uh, Philip Hildebrand, Stan Fischer, Jean Bovin, um, and Elga Bartsch, which is a kind of distinguished group of economists and former central bankers, uh, saying that we need to put in place frameworks now to think about monetary financing and fiscal policy as a kind of logical extension of inflation targeting frameworks when you're at the zero lower bound. Um, I do think that we need to start taking that seriously, and I think that actually the UK could take a lead in this space because, again, we, we don't have the kind of legal barriers that are in place in the, in the Eurozone. Uh, I think that the politics should be more conducive to this in the UK than it is in America, where I think all the controversy around the central bank is, is much more deeply ingrained in, in the legislature than it is here. Um, I think the reasons why we need to think about this, even though it's fair to say normal fiscal policy has some room to run and, and could be a tool. I think there are probably three reasons. Um, two of them are, well, the, well, the first is sort of a political economy reason. I mean, I, I don't know what it is about the behavior of parliament over the last three years that gives anyone confidence that we will have well-targeted, timely fiscal policy put in place in a recession. I mean, like quite the reverse. Uh, I think we have to get used to the fact that the sort of classic model of the British constitution where a government has a large majority and is able to basically enact the fiscal policy at once is not necessarily the world we're in anymore. A world of minority governments doesn't work like that, where you've got the SNP occupying a large number of the seats in Scotland, where you've got uh, parties like the Brexit Party and the Liberal Democrats, meaning that the probability of any single party getting a large majority anytime soon has got to be lower than it has been for a long time. And therefore, uh, in an era of minority governments, the idea that you get timely political economy that operates through fiscal policy, I think, is very unrealistic. Um, uh, I also think that, you know, for the UK, uh, fiscal policy is always going to be constrained a little bit, and I think rightly so, by risk considerations. You, you're always going to have, you're sitting in number 10 in the Treasury, you're always going to have an eye on how far can I push this before I make myself vulnerable, potentially in a few years' time, if I get a big reset in interest rates. Um, that is always going to constrain, or sh I think should constrain, quite how radical and proactive you're willing to be on fiscal policy. Um, you know, we don't have some of the benefits that the US has in terms of the kind of willingness of the rest of the world to kind of finance us indefinitely. And we've seen in, uh, at least several times recently that, you know, you do get uh, a sort of confidence impact in the UK comes through the currency very, very quickly as soon as we start to um, uh, sort of push the bounds there. It doesn't necessarily have to come through um, government debt markets. Um, and then finally, I think there's a sort of, you know, to the extent that there are any Ricardian effects of conventional fiscal policy, uh, the, the, uh, that I there is a benefit to trying to do this through a kind of monetary financing route rather than debt financing. I know that there's a big debate about how, how powerful those are, but in an era where maybe debt levels become something that is part of a big part of the public debate, again, that's another constraint. So I do think that there is, uh, you know, it, Mainly for the, I think Jan makes a very good point about this question about is is the government paying interest on reserves or not, and does this make it, you know, if the government is paying interest on reserves, then this is going to look more like a useful institutional framework for generating predictable fiscal policy response, uh, and less like monetary financing. Um, if you're not going to pay interest on reserves, obviously it's a much bigger step. Maybe there's a sort of gradation there of how far you can go. But even if it's not the full radical monetary financing, at least a situation where you had the Bank of England saying, so the way the proposed mechanism works in the BlackRock report is that the Bank of England would say on a regular basis how big the facility available to the government is. The government would then have freedom to spend that facility on what it wanted. Obviously, you still, I think, need accountability for tax and spending to Parliament rather than anyone else. And then the Bank of England would be able to comment on a regular basis about how effectively targeted that spending was on the inflation mandate. Um, and I think that that would introduce a level of kind of predictability and um, you know, it sounds radical, but actually I think it might help to generate fiscal policy that was a bit more orderly and a bit more focused. Uh, just one, I think that there's something that isn't in that report that we might need to think about is changing the mandate to more of a dual mandate like in the US. I think there's a lot of evidence increasingly that inflation has become much less sensitive to kind of domestic slack. Uh, 
uh, where there's a big debate in the academic community about this. Uh, Phillips curves are not as responsive as they used to be. Uh, targeting inflation is increasingly targeting something that is set by um, uh, commodity prices, global competition, uh, technology, uh, and, and increasingly less something that is influenced by domestic labor markets and, and sort of the traditional sort of price wage impact. So therefore, I think, I think we probably should be leaning less on inflation and maybe introducing something like the sort of full employment mandate that the Federal Reserve has if we are going to be going beyond conventional monetary policy because inflation is not going to be a reliable enough mechanism to steer through that. So I think that might be an important part of this. Uh, and I also think that in, final point on this monetary financing point, again, at the moment, the UK, I think, still has just about institutions that are credible enough and a Bank of England that is independent enough where actually it could bear this added burden and we actually have the ability, unlike the Eurozone or maybe the US, to be innovative. And um, uh, again, I think there is a risk to that. I think markets, yeah, I think, again, there's an argument for putting this in place earlier rather than later. I think, frankly, and uh, there, there might be others who disagree, I think a Corbyn-led government introducing a facility like this would encounter a lot more skepticism from financial markets and elsewhere than a Conservative government introducing this because I think there would be an inevitable suspicion that this was just an excuse for very permanently loose fiscal policy. Um, so I do think that's worth considering. I think, uh, you know, it, it sounds quite radical, but if we're going to think about responding to the next downturn seriously, then we, I think we should consider proposals like this. Um, finally, just a final point about micro-interventions. So a lot of government time in recessions is spent dreaming up and implementing a lot of really quite expensive micro-interventions with the goal of having macroeconomic impact. So car scrappage schemes, stamp duty holidays, temporary capital allowance increases, uh, the time to pay scheme operated through HMRC, mortgage support schemes to keep people in their houses. Um, some of these are probably quite sensible. Some of them are very gimmicky. I think a very useful research uh, agenda for the Resolution Foundation, but also for the Treasury would say, okay, let's get a proper inf you know, evidence base in place now about which of these work, which of them don't, uh, because a lot of money and effort will be, will be focused on those. I think that these, finally, I think, the, the, I haven't mentioned Brexit, but I'm going to now, um, is that I think that if the, these sort of micro-interventions, I think, will probably be particularly important if the next recession is triggered by a no-deal Brexit, um, because the, the mechanism through which a no-deal Brexit might turn into a recession is going to be uh, you know, temporary disruption to business cash flows leading to permanent insolvency and therefore kind of hysteresis effects um, and, uh, to, you know, uh, permanent employment effects. And therefore, uh, particularly if a no deal state might be quite temporary because there might be quite quickly some sort of renegotiation afterwards to put back in place kind of orderly processes, the Treasury and Bank of England thinking very carefully now about things like uh, working capital provision, cash flow support, um, uh, you know, uh, reduced hours agreements like a lot of continental European countries have in place in order to re reduce these hysteresis effects for something that might only be might only last a few months. And in order to kind of reduce the permanent impact on the economy, we might end up finding that actually microeconomic interventions in a no deal recession are more important than anything the Bank of England or large scale fiscal policy can do in that kind of timeline. Great. Thank you very much, Rupert. I, for one, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, Boris's leaflet, which is vote Tory, get monetary financing. It's going to be a, the, but it's a kind of, get money. Okay, that, that's a better, that's a better leaflet. The, uh, thanks, Stephanie. The, um, on on well, the point, Rupert. Sounds pretty good to me. It sounds good to you. Yeah, no, you're, 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 you're voting. The, um, on your last point, actually, on why, which is kind of a lot of what Kate's saying, which is, we, this report focuses on how do you deal with the demand side of any recession, the out, how do you try and close the output gap. Obviously, in every recession, the first thing you're trying to do is get rid of the thing that caused the recession or yeah. attempt to address it or to unwind it, as you said. That is a whole other policy agenda. And we will be coming to bits of that. Anyone that's really keen on the response to a no-deal recession, we'll be doing an event on that on the 19th of what you should do, which basically comes down to how are you going to lend money to loads of companies without pissing out the wall, the, um, uh, which is more or less what we're going to be uh, faced with. Now, let's get some questions or answers from you guys. Are there some mics roving? There's one mic here, two mics. Why don't we start with John? John, John Wilbur. Um, the um, national balance sheet is, is something that's been missing from the discussion, maybe in the report, but it's been missing from the discussion. And the, the IMF Fiscal Monitor produced this, this great report last year on how 
national balance sheets uh, have, have di differ, differ so much from different countries. In the UK, we've sold off almost, almost all the family silver. So although our debt levels are not so high, our national balance sheet is in a very poor uh, situation. So that, that really ought to be a major focus of, um, of policy. John, you're not even you have to stop because that's the next two papers, both coming out in September on the need. Someone looking very happy back there is the author of them both. We totally agree. And Ed? Hi, um, Ed Conway from Sky News. Yeah, like Steph, I was very excited by the automatic <laughs> stabilizers thing. I feel like I've been waiting decades to, to see some sort of analysis on uh, how they've changed over time. So, so thank you for that. Um, I was curious, though, I mean, it, you know, Looking at, at the various different metrics you've got there, including the chart showing you know, generosity of benefits over, over time, you might have expected that over sub subsequent recessions, then you would have seen an increasing kind of increase in inequality as a result of the recession or whatever you know, metric you're choosing to, to look at. But actually, I was struck by, I think, figures six and seven in, in your report showing that this recession wasn't. Um, as uh, as bad on that front as, as as many previous ones on it on employment and on wages. So I just wonder, is, you know, do you think that is is entirely down to the discretionary fiscal and monetary stimulus as opposed to everything else that which I presume is the answer, uh, or is that just a challenge to how on earth we can measure the change in the automatic stabilizers? Great question. And this lady. Silvana Tanreiro speaking as an academic uh, on Rupert's comment on why the Phillips curve is flatter. Um, that's because central banks are targeting inflation. So insofar as they are successful at doing that, then inflation will be around the target and then uncorrelated with slack. So that was a very quick version of your paper. Mm. <laughs> there are other reasons as well. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Right, look, let's go through these. So, um, so no one from the Resolution Foundation is allowed to answer John's question. Uh, or no one, anyone want to take balance sheets? Well, just to make the point, I think it's a reason why governments will always feel a little bit constrained when it comes to mm. fiscal policy in the UK. You know, you've got, you are always going to have an eye on risk management and the way that people perceive the long-term solvency. So there is a general point. When, like, in a world of low interest rates, balance sheets are bigger. Government, people, so people are making lots of arguments about I want to nationalise this or I want to borrow with low rates to pay for this stuff. It's all free money. In that world, the case for focusing on your overall balance sheet, not just your debt for good policy outcomes, is clearly like very, very important to um, future albeit coming with constraints of how you actually measure it well. But, the, um, but it's still uh, very important. Now, the st Sterling? My yeah. favourite topic. Um, I mean, on that, we, I mentioned a bit on the, just the balance of how uh, we had much slower. We only had what, a slightly less than 2% fall in employment, even given a 5% or more decline in, in GDP. I mean, I think that's what, you know, one of the great things was that the one way or another, the Bank of England did manage to achieve some inflation throughout that post-crisis period in a way that the US didn't. And we know that fundamentally that was Sterling played a huge part in that. But I think you can see mechanically almost how that priced people into work. I mean, you get the kind of real wage figures that we always talk about. Um, but if you compare, I looked at this compared to the US where you couldn't get, because if you think there's nominal wage rigidity, where you couldn't get the kind of real wage decline in the US because inflation was so low and indeed negative at one point. Um, it was worth about, for us, if you just do it on the back of an envelope, it was worth about 900,000 jobs that we were able to have real wages for um, purely because of the higher level of inflation. Um, if you're assuming that inflation wages by and large can't fall in nominal terms. So I think that was, and that will of course come up um, if we think about the likely mechanism for uh, when we get the next recession. But I think it's also, when I say about needing to talk more about these things, um, and I think that's one of the helpful things about the report, saying even just talking about making the fiscal stabilisation role more explicit in the fiscal rules, you know, should be about partly about having these kind of conversations, talking about what kind of pattern of adjustment is better or worse in a distributive way. I, mean, I think there's a link to that. Uh, to the distributional point in the automatic stabilizers as well, because of the yeah. way, because of, of course, uh, a lot of the big benefits are inflation uprated. The fact that the recession in the UK generated yeah. a lot of inflation mm. because of the depreciation meant that there was actually the bottom yeah. proportion of the population were entirely protected from that real income hit. Because of, the, if you go back to sort of eight, nine, ten, eleven, there were some very big up ratings during that period, and there were also discretionary decisions by government to top up various parts of tax credit. So, for yeah. example, the child element of the child tax credit kept being topped up above inflation as well. So they were very sort of powerful automatic stabilizers and distributional. But if those benefits are now lower, I mean, then you get less of that impact. So the in-work benefits, that's what I was saying. Well, there's a general thing. So long as you're inflation up rate, the key is that you obviously do not want to be freezing 
Yeah, I mean, mm. they're not that much lower, so particularly in work benefits. So the amount of money spent through universal credit is now Less very close to the amount of money originally yeah. spent through the tax credit system. So yeah. they're not actually that much lower than they were. But, and I do think it's worth, like, we've got to pause it. Like, let's not assume the next crisis is definitely like the last one, okay? So a lot, like, you will, we will get the pound falling and giving us some real wage fall slash great flexibility if, we get, if the pound falls a lot and it fell by 30% last time. So I think we all forget, what is the big thing we all missed in the crisis, how big the sterling falls were and what that would mean for the macro response so everyone was still planning for an unemployment recession. Actually, and that was extremely timely because it happened it. before the recession totally. started. Totally, it was ideal. Yeah. But let's not yeah. assume that happens. So I was at a job centre last week in South London. If a recession happens again, and it's, it's, not, it's not asymmetric with the UK being the worst affected, the pound will not do that. We will not get that inflation response and we will get a lot of unemployment. And right now, our job centres are not ready. Like we've, we've suddenly brought like, you know, huge numbers of more people into job centres with universal credit in work people. Yeah, that's going to have to stop on day one of a recession that is not, does not look like the last recession. It's not just a flexible labour market giving us no unemployment. Jan, inequality. Yes, um, so I think one of you mentioned that we have been defensive on this before. Um, I think we have been analytical on this. Uh, <laughs> That's definitely defensive. <laughs> so the, a couple of key points that I've said before, but they're really fundamental. So you know, if you're going to make a list of lots of things that drive inequality, monetary policy is way down the list after many, many, many other things. If you do decide you want to focus on monetary policy, then there's a couple of important points to make. First of all, um, QE, in terms of the income distribution, QE boosts employment and wage growth, and that helps people at all levels of the income distribution, particularly at the low end. You're going to talk about asset prices. Yes, QE probably boosts equity prices relative to what they otherwise would have been, although equity prices in real terms, I think, are still below what they were uh, a decade ago. Um, but it also boosts house prices, and it's not the case that only wealthy people own houses. So, you know, the, Kate talked about a redistribution between people who own and who rent. That's true, but that's not the same thing as saying a redistribution between people who are well off and people who are less well off. It's a completely different kind of redistribution. But just yeah. to encourage a bit more defensiveness. Yeah. The, um, so that is true. Is that the, but part of the problem is because, so insofar as we thought about the effect on asset prices as temporary, because we plan to unwind this, part of the challenge is once you've had it for so long, 10 years, for some of the, in, anyone that has transacted an asset during that price, gone from an area where they were a renter to being an owner, it is a permanent life, life, like life's consumption hit to them, whether or not it unwinds in the future. I think in retrospect, thinking back to kind of discussions in 2009 about should we do QE, should we not? Obviously we had no choice, so kind of the answer was yes. But, the, but part of the problem was we, we thought we were doing something for two years and we've done it for 10. So it's re the real issue is um, monetary, um, monetary conditions are just looser for longer than any of us thought. And so the level of temporariness of the effect on wealth is just, for anyone, it's not temporary if I sold my house at high so, prices. Sorry, go uh, What's more, it's not temporary in a, a geographic sense, because of course people who are in London where land prices have, got, have risen much more and a much bigger yeah. portion of the house price have yeah. benefited disproportionately, whereas of course if you go to the North East, house prices are still, you know, yeah. more or less, more or less where they were. QE4. So, but, I, but I'm not suggesting no, but the, but the way in which it's played through has been has been has been very. I'm not suggesting, by the way, since I was involved, that I think QE was a mistake. I just think sometimes you ha I think it's sometimes right to acknowledge that there have been some adverse effects yeah. round the side, and that it, it's there where I think people th think the bank's been a bit defensive about it. Right, let's get some. Can, sorry, can I just? <laughs> I was going to make a third point, which is a, a non-defensive one. Yeah. If you go through all these points and then still you decide that somewhere you'd have identified. Yeah some bit of inequality yeah. which has become yeah. worse because of the actions of the central bank um, and, and you think you've very clearly identified that, then my question to you is, okay, what do you think we should do about it? Because my very strong view is we as a central bank, nothing. nothing. We are targeted with achieving the inflation oh. target yeah. with the instruments that we have. If the government considers that there are some undesirable side effects here and there, yeah. then it is the government that has the tools and the legitimacy and the political mandate to offset some of these inequalities. Totally not agree. But, we, but, we, but we should be transparent about it. it because then you'll force that conversation to happen. Yeah. Whereas Absolutely. we didn't have that conversation. Yeah. Right. right. Yes. Let's get some questions and then we'll come back because I'm conscious. There's a gentleman here, Chris over here, and a gentleman in the middle here. Uh, thank you. My name is Moyn Islam. I'm a rate strategist at Barclays Investment Bank. Um, it strikes me that the presentation has been given within the framework of I guess what you call developed market privilege, which is that you have the luxury of running counter-cyclical fiscal and 
monetary policy. It strikes me also that the UK has burnt a heck of a lot of institutional matches really, really fast over the last two to three years. And we understand how to measure monetary policy credibility through the lens of market measures of inflation compensation, but how do we measure uh, fiscal policy credibility? Because arguably, if you look at the relative shape of the gilt curve to the OIS sterling asset swap, sterling curve or LIBOR curves, uh, the UK already looks fiscally shaky, if not non-credible. And if you look at you know technical technical measures such as uh, gilt forward asset swaps, these are already at super high levels, levels actually beyond that you saw in 2008 and 9 when the bar government was borrowing a lot of money very quickly and very fast. So your whole framework is based on the idea that the UK remains a developed market in terms of market reaction and the reaction function of um, policy makers. What happens if that's not true? Yeah, we are definitely assuming Britain remains a developed country for the mm. foreseeable future. Chris? Uh, uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. Uh, a question relatively similar to the last one. Uh, the obvious answer to some of the problems that put up here would be to run much looser fiscal policy so you could have tighter policy and the overall balance would be the same. Uh, no one has suggested that on the panel this morning, which suggests that fiscal policy might well be out of ammo just as much as monetary policy. Can the panel comment? Sure. Right. Yeah, and who else? There's a gentleman in the middle here. We've got a mic. Sharmina. Thank you. Uh, it's William Schomburg from Reuters. It's a question really uh, for Gurchan. Um, you made it clear that you feel the Bank of England has less firepower than it did in prev ahead of previous crises. You also say that there are risks from some of the more radical options like raising interest rate target and, uh, and, and helicopter money. I just wanted to hear from you what you feel really would be the, the most likely response. Is it, is it really, should we infer from that that you know, reliance on traditional uh, vanilla fiscal policy is, is probably where you see it. Great. Right, James, why don't you kick us off on the, the balance of risks here between the world as it is, thinking we can definitely do policy like this, versus maybe the world's not like that, and so fiscal policy is not available, traditional fiscal policy is not available. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really important point. I mean, I, I guess sitting here with 10-year um, gilts at, at half a percent, it really feels quite difficult to to make a, a credibility argument on, on, on this side. But I think the framework works well. The framework should be able to specify how you react when fiscal policy is also constrained. I think the th one major thing we've learned is that frameworks that work only in good times are not really worth the, the paper they're written on. So I think th you know, this whole discussion is really important. But I just don't think that's, that's where we are at this point, both in terms of both in terms of market pricing, I take your point on the on the on the technical side. I mean, just just to be to to emphasise Jan's point, when you do monetary financing, you inevitably um, completely radically change the framework in terms of the balance of policy making between fiscal and monetary. And for us, there are big risks that come with that, and you would only want to do it in extremis. I take. Um, a lot of Rupert's points about why that might be desirable um, in certain circumstances. I, I think a key reason why you might worry at the moment about uh, fiscal being constrained is it doesn't have this credible framework for addressing uh, recessions, having that counter-cyclical role. I think you know having having that, which is a key recommendation from from our paper, that would you know help people understand exactly how fiscal policy would respond. Jan, your sense is to you. Um, so th the essence of the question is, you know, monetary policy is but one part of a multi-dimensional toolkit. And, and what you're asking is, you know, how should we use all the different dimensions? Uh, and I'm afraid that's really not a question for me to answer. I, I, the, the whole point about central bank operational independence is kind of a two-way thing. It means that you know, people don't tell the MPC what to do with interest rates, but the MPC don't tell other policymakers what to do with their tools. Uh, and I think the, mm. that's, a, that's a separation which it's, needs to be, in my view, needs to be preserved. The, where we do have a role is, and, and that's exactly what I'm doing here today, is to say, look, our lever doesn't move by as much as it used to move in the past. And so therefore, when you're thinking about all the levers together, you may want to take that into account so that you think about creating more room on the other levers. It's not for me to say, and therefore you should, you know, it's best to use that one or that one or in this, in this sequence, that would be way beyond the remit of the MPC. Mm. 
Right, do you want to pick up this general kind of fiscal? Is it well, a good just idea? Just responding to some more and Chris. Um, so I, I do think it's absolutely right that, that fiscal policy, so there's two statements, but I think everyone can agree with the second, some people would agree with the first. So the first, which I think is that fiscal policy probably is more constrained than, than we might suspect, given the risks out there. But I think the second thing that everyone agrees with is that policymakers will always worry about that a bit, and that will always therefore constrain their willingness to, be, to use fiscal policy extremely aggressively. And I think this is why, that's the reason why I think it is worth considering a framework where you've got formal coordination through the Bank of England creating a facility. Um, the, the, the second point, you know, the, the sort of luxury of being a developed market as opposed to an emerging market is something that I think we should not take for granted. And certainly if you look at you know, equity bond correlations in the UK over the last few years, we look more like an EM, and we're certainly slipping down the, the correlation matrix towards being EM where equities and bonds set off uh, at the same time because you get kind of just capital in and out is the dominating factor as opposed to uh, a sort of solid expectation framework. Um, uh, and of course, the, the kind of crucial thing that you lose if you do become more of an emerging market is that when you loosen policy, financial conditions tighten because you get capital outflows and a loss of confidence. Uh, and therefore, you are forced to only, the only way you can stabilize your economy is to force a very deep recession on the private sector uh, and kind of come through that adjustment process as we've seen time and time and again. For, you know, recently, we've seen Turkey, Brazil, yeah. uh, and now Argentina with some particular added problems of external debt. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to be very, very careful uh, of, of, of giving, let's not get to that point. I, I do think that, you know, let's not get overexcited. We're not at that point yet. I still think we do have credible institutions. I think that the correlation structure at the moment is mainly driven by the Brexit uncertainty, um, which may go on for a very long time, albeit. Um, but, uh, th but therefore, th I think that the, the, the you, know, you talked about the temptation for Boris Johnson of saying vote conservative, get free money. Um, I think the message to policymakers is if, you know, we may be getting to a point down the line where some of these tools about monetary financing are required. The message to policymakers is, is if you want to have these tools available to you, the, the, the value of maintaining credible institutions so that you can operate them is very, very, very high. So therefore, the risk, particularly if you're Jeremy Corbyn coming into government, if you want to have the ability to do non-standard interventions like this, you need to have credibility, because otherwise markets will respond to these kinds of announcements very, very negatively and will have an opposite impact on your economy that you intended. Kate. Well, I, I mean, I agree with you about the need for credibility. I would be concerned for the role of the central bank in a world where the fiscal side says, well, actually, we'd love to do more but the Bank of England says we can't. I think that, I mean, I just find that something, I find that something that would really I don't think the framework me. suggests that. I think okay, okay, it would always be available to the government to go for it. We're on list of well, Yes, but in that, but in, yeah, but, it, but well, I thought that w was what you were suggesting, actually, but anyway, perhaps I misunderstood. That's not what's in the, okay. Perhaps I, perhaps I misunderstood. I thought the idea was that the bank warranted the fiscal facility. Is that There's a the minimum, a, a minim but the government is always able to further. borrow, uh, issue bonds to borrow Beyond more that, than that. Yeah. This okay, would be but a kind of yeah, floor. but even so, I can, I could, I think this is very. I think the size of that facility would be would be quite important. The other thing I just want to say very briefly is we've talked a lot about distribution and interest rates. We haven't talked at all about distribution and sterling. Mm -hmm. Falling sterling is really bad for distribution, and actually was one of the things. If you look at the immediate aftermath of the crisis, was one of the things that caused distribution issues. So we shouldn't lose sight of that. The fact that actually it may be that the Fiscal issues appear much more in sterling than they do in gilt yields, and that will be bad for the poor. Mm. And last word to our host. <laughs> um, well, actually, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that have been mm -hmm. said before. I think it's, I mean, it's very striking what Rupert was saying just now about, which is absolutely right, about Britain having behaved more and more like an emerging market over the last few years. I mean, it's very striking. If we look back to 2010, um, uh, one of the great uh, things that we learned at that time was that the comparisons with Greece, uh, when we had sort of a similar budget deficit, were a kind of inappropriate in some sense because we had control of our own currency. And we'd sort of learnt that lesson that actually we weren't in any serious sense at risk of becoming Greece. But it looked, does maybe with Brexit we have done everything we can <laughs> to make that comparison. You know, next time it really will be relevant. And maybe when we stop worrying about our uh, underlying credibility in the market is just when we should be worrying about it. So I do, uh, it reminds me I should think about that. Um, what Kate said about, oh, sorry, I think Rupert said as well about um, it not necessarily being, uh, you know, something that's worth thinking about having a broader mandate. Uh, I do think that's interesting. If you look around the world, collectively, the major central banks have sort of delivered too little inflation and too little growth over the last few years. And 
uh, in a sense, to have some kind of political tilt against the sole focus on inflation now, even if we worry about Donald Trump's tweets and everything else, is not inherently, uh, it seems to me, an unhealthy thing. And I think even you know, the discussions that uh, Corbyn uh, and the Labour Party have raised about introducing a productivity target, of course, caused enormous consternation and predictable um, outrage among kind of purists. But it doesn't, whatever you say about the practicality and everything else, it doesn't seem to me an inherently illegitimate thing to raise to say that the central bank should be concerned about real variables, even if we worry about the inability to actually affect them in the short term. It's not so different from a nominal GDP target when one comes down to it. So um, I think we should all be, you know, to Kate's point about not being so purist mm. about mm. independence and political interference, um, I think is, is well taken. I would just, I mean, it's unusual for me, but I would end on a positive note. Because if you actually look at the UK, um, our ability to be a bit messy when it comes to the lines between monetary and fiscal and a bit messy when it comes to central bank independence, it's actually much better than either the US or the ECB. If you look at how, for example, the letter writing process has worked, the fact that we're target, the bank is target dependent, so there's an explicit political process about setting the target. When you saw QE happen, the way that process of explicit guarantee by the Treasury um, being there right in the heart of the policy. These were all instruments. Was, this was like an, adding an accountability to extraordinary actions by the central bank, which was completely lacking uh, in a kind of formal sense in both the Eurozone and the US. So I actually think we have a good track record here that uh, other countries, they're not looking to us to learn very much at all at the moment, but they might well look at that very small piece of our infrastructure. They might. <laughs> they, um, right, look, they, uh, can we thank our panel for their thoughts today? I think we've obviously covered rather a lot of ground, but the basic point is the status quo is not optimal, I think is the polite uh, way of uh, putting it, but the world is messy. There are downside risks to us, Brexit, but there are upside risks. Inflation expectations are well anchored. Our institutions have more flexibility, but the danger is we just leave it and then wish we'd done something in the crisis. So go off, and anyone that's a policymaker, please go and fix it. Thank you very much. See you soon. <laughs>